Hello and welcome to another fantastic, incredible episode of The Slime. I'm Jacob Rosaro here as always with... Benjamin Smith. What's up, everybody? Yeah, I don't think we've done that in a while. Yeah. And we're back here to talk about a B-movie classic, a movie that brought gore and just grit and grime and the uh, grindhouse nastiness. aesthetic yes, to the mainstream. <laughs> Uh, if you haven't figured it out, I'm talking about Texas Chainsaw Massacre, a pillar of New Hollywood, a classic, our second uh, spooky season installment. We're doing the classics. We just did Nightmare on Elm Street. You heard us talk a bit about this movie last episode, um, but this week we're going to be covering uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So, uh, Ben, initial thoughts on this movie? Well, first of all, if we're uh, comparing it to last week's Nightmare on Elm Street... Uh, these two movies are very, very, very different. Um, in a good way, though. From, because it's nice to have some variety in mm-hmm. the horror genre, right? From very different time periods. Yeah. Even though, if you think of... I think they're ten years apart. Yeah, I was about to say, they're about ten years apart. But it shows you, I don't know, maybe how fast uh, pop culture moves. Uh, they feel like they could be decades apart. To me, they perfectly represent the era they're in i mean nightmare on elm street is very is uh very big and loud and kind of cheesy yeah and uh very 80s and it's kind of got the teen heartthrob kind of thing and so does texas chainsaw massacre but it, um that uh texas chainsaw does it in a different way where it's this gritty 70s more uh tempered down you know just less flashy kind you of see it, it's from Darker. it's from the 70s but it does feel like a 60s movie and i guess that's because it was filmed uh in the early 70s it came out in 74 yeah. so i guess you'll find um a lot of themes and uh like even the film grain and the colors the way that it's shot like it seems a lot older than it actually is and that works to the movie's benefit mm-hmm. a lot because this movie is absolutely disgusting and revolting and unsettling and did I say grimy? Did we say that? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's where it comes from, right? It's the grindhouse scene. That's what that look yeah. is. There's uh, countless other horror movies just like this one that just, just look just as dirty yeah. and disgusting and just uh, really add to the atmosphere that didn't uh, make it uh, as far as uh, this movie did. Um, but, I, I mean, what really separates this movie to me, I find it's like, it's hard to think, it's hard for me to, like, pin down in particular, but um, I really like how the how the movie's just kind of unsettling the whole way through, and it's yeah. a different kind of horror movie that we don't get as much now. It doesn't rely so much on gore and jump scares. More is just kind of like paranoia, um, you know, feeling uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of terror, and just kind of shock. Like, it, it's else. overall a bit of a slower pace until shit hits the fan. And yeah. then it just keeps going and going. Like I guess it does a good job at letting that tension build. Um, maybe let's just talk about Leatherface as a character, as a horror icon to mm-hmm. start. Because, I mean, if you ask me, like in terms of horror icons, we have Ghostface and Leatherface, uh, Freddy, Jason, and Michael Myers. Those are probably the... Is that four or five? The five horsemen yeah. of the apocalypse, you know? <laughs> um, and they're all pretty different. Like, if you ask me, like, Jason is probably the most bland. Uh, no disrespect to Jason, but I feel like each character here has a, some sort of gimmick. And, man, Le- Leatherface is definitely probably the most creepy of all of them. Um, because he's so alien, too, you know? Yeah, and you kind of just don't understand... Uh what he is and he's just kind of gross looking uh there's particular shots um that i always notice where you see his teeth yeah and they just look kind of gross and he's got these like crooked just like disgusting teeth under that mask and um and again i think a lot of what the movie is is it's just it's a lot of unknown like nothing's pinned down it's just everything kind of just fills you with terror um and i like how it slowly builds uh yeah it does um it does that uh teenager vacation whole stick you know where you got a van full of uh young adults um traveling through the desert in texas and you know one thing after another bad things start to happen and 
they end up uh, <laughs> they end up um, you know the thing is it's it's not just Leatherface that poses a threat yeah. you know it's it's the whole uh, family that Leatherface is a part of um, which is really interesting too because it's you know there is a new Texas Chainsaw video game that just came out a couple months ago and you're not just surviving against Leatherface you know yeah. every member of the family is somewhat of a threat you know a, a cannibalistic family mm-hmm. um, and that's cool they they don't explain it at all no um, you're just left to kind of figure out and piece together as as time goes and I like it better uh, like this and I uh, again I just want to talk about the atmosphere the movie creates like right from the beginning you see the grotesque like pictures of like the rotting corpse that's kind of like the opening yeah. shot after the, the narrator reads the crime and says it's one of the most horrible crimes and like that kind of voice which yeah. nowadays would be considered really cheesy but it just works no and it it's cool it theme. sets the tone yeah and it goes like blood red and there's that creepy theme and just sets the tone immediately and you know you hear reports of a grave robber stealing remains from a from a um from a graveyard and like that's kind of the first thing that kind of tells you that things are off and then yeah it just kind of cuts to these young kids in the early 70s uh driving around texas trying to get to a house in the country to hang out and the movie's so low budget like if you look at the movie yeah i actually want to talk some numbers here um yeah i was gonna do it later but since you brought it up uh a low budget as you said for 140k the film was produced um which adjusted for inflation nowadays is about 800k. Yeah. Back in the 70s they had a $140,000 budget and the film grossed uh 30 million domestically Amazing. in the box office. So that is huge huge profit. And how much more money is it made in the ensuing 40 years, especially so, in the DVD and VHS age? Since then, the movie has grossed. Oh, you even know. 150 million as of 2019. It's uh, pulled in 150 million since it's released and started a franchise, started an iconic mm-hmm. character. Um, and as I said, they got video games coming out now. There was a new movie that yeah. came out last year. Don't check it out because I did. No, but and it's it was terrible. very, very, very bad. But because look, the whole thing about this movie is. That is a 70s movie, and that is dirty and grimy, and it's hard to recreate that these days, you know? A lot of the charm of this movie is that it's from the 70s. Yeah, and I mean, I just, uh, speaking to the low budget, like, um, it's just, it's very simple. Uh, They keep it very simple, and this movie doesn't take place in that many different uh, locations when you really think about it. So it's, you know, on a nice summer day, August 18th, 1973, we just passed 50 Mm. years of this incident. And, uh, you know, they really only, you really only see the graveyard, them in the van driving through the Texas country, a farm, uh, a gas station, and then, like, the houses. Yeah. And then that's basically it. And, uh, like, we could make that movie here. Yeah. In our, you know, town. Uh, and it takes place in one field, really, yeah. like one plot of land. And it's incredible. Like, I mean, and and it's kind of down to the performances. Like, I think the acting for its time, uh, I mean, for our time can seem kind of uh, cheesy, but I think it's very effective. And some of the sequences are really good at holding your attention in a movie that keeps it kind of simple budget-wise. I mean, like Edwin Neal's performance as... Uh, Nubbins, the young guy in the family, when he yeah. first comes into the van and just cuts himself Sets out the of tone. nowhere, yeah, and is showing them uh, pictures of chopped up meat, and uh, you know, I just think stuff like that is like the backbone of this movie, and just it doesn't yeah. need a big budget, yeah, and that just adds again, it's just building onto the the feeling of knowing that something is not right, and, yeah. Uh, I think it also has a lot to do with isolation, like this family's isolation, yeah, uh, from. Uh, society and from you know they're really and and you get this feeling that the locals also know about this family and that the pose that and the threat that they pose um and they it's all hush hush you know i feel like the locals don't really say much and they may may have some sort of unspoken deal you know that they'll just let them do their own thing if they if they uh, leave everybody else else unbothered and that really like sets the tone of like 
these teenagers are kind of being lured into a trap, you know, and they're the mm-hmm. only people that know that don't know that something is off or that something is going to happen. But we do have one character who's paranoid throughout the whole film yeah, exactly. because of that uh, first member of the family we're introduced to. Um, but yeah, it's oh, I kind of wanted to talk about the last chase scene. Oh, that's, you know, the, <laughs> the classic. Ten minute long chase scene uh, between one of the last of the teenagers and Leatherface. Uh, this chase scene goes on forever and ever and ever. And, you know, you can't really do that these days anymore, no. you know, with people's attention spans and whatnot. But, man, it's it's a stressful movie. And there's a lot of elements to it that I like. I really don't think this movie would hold up if it weren't for the threat of that the whole family poses yeah. because you know with the movie that came out last year uh it's, it, the family is non-existent it's just leatherface that poses the mm-hmm. threat and i feel like there has to be some sort of depth and they can't just be a, a aimless killer there has to be something else you know that holds up i just like the unknown though in this movie i like that there's a deeper thing but i also like it just remains unknown, and I think it totally plays into. Uh, I'm sure if you if you've grown up in countries like Canada, the United States, Australia, I'm sure in other parts of the world, but I know like redneck cult stereo culture and like stereotypes are really um, prevalent in like North American uh, culture, and you know we grew up you know hearing stories and talking about people, the weird people who live out in the woods. No offense to rural people, you know, and I feel like that this movie uh, plays into that perfectly. But also, did you notice just how much of a vegan, vegetarian, like propaganda piece this kind of is? I've been told that's kind of the hidden message and it's pretty blatant. Yeah, I didn't really notice it until you mentioned it to me, but it makes complete sense now because they just portray um, butchery and uh, meat and slaughter as some sort of animalistic thing you know in this movie and there's so many there's so many uh, references to describing how animals killed Uh, they do that scene where they show the farm with the scary music and then describing the killing and there's tons of scenes with animal bones animal teeth shown as a symbol like animal parts uh, along with human parts and like um yeah, it's just kind of cool that this kind of cheesy, corny popcorn movie on the surface kind of has this uh, really cool message that it shows through uh, symbolism, I guess. I was actually um, doing a little bit of research on the movie today, um, and more so on the character of Leatherface himself. And throughout the movie, Leatherface changes the masks that he wears yeah. and the faces that uh, he wears. And... Not much is explained in this film, but there is some uh, context we can where there's some context to it as to why he changes his faces and whatnot. And it's because Leatherface as like a person and a human being is he feels like he's really misunderstood and he can't communicate with people very well. So he changes the faces that he wears uh you know hour by hour day by day depending on how he feels um majority of the film he's just wearing um the iconic you know uh, bland face but you know there's later on in the film it takes place inside of the house the family's house and he's wearing uh, a female's face because at that point in the film he is kind of feeling like wanting to be a caretaker you know a a motherly figure um, then later on, he said they sit down for dinner, and he switches his face once again to a face with makeup on and whatnot. You know, like the pretty woman face mm-hmm. is what uh, it's referred to as. So that's cool. That's cool. It adds more. Co- this character is so unknown, but there's subtle hints as to why he changes his faces and whatnot because he's a character that has a tough time communicating his feelings, and the only way he really knows how to do that is by changing these disgusting grotesque faces of the people he's he's murdered yeah it's he uh, it's just incredible i mean really from the beginning lots of hidden imagery yeah and i like how they uh i wonder if this was due to budget constraints but like almost the all all the characters are worked in all the uh all the characters in the family are worked in before the before like the initial attack other than leather yeah. leather face so yeah. 
you know, obviously like Nubbin's in the car. And then of course we see at the gas station, right? Like that's how he works. And, uh, yeah. yeah, that kind of like, uh, the gas station attendant kind of lures you into a, like a false, uh, uh, sense of security later in the movie. Yeah. A false sense of hope. You know, yeah. you think he's going to help, uh, help out and, but no, that's not the case. You know, as I said earlier, you know, there's more at play here. It's like a whole community that's kind of gone, uh, sideways and that uh there's more people a part of this cult type of thing the movie also has a lot of like uh maury type of uh sacrificial uh displays yeah. um i don't really know a lot about that or the type of words to use but you know animal bones and carcasses mm-hmm. you know arranged in certain ways epitaphs uh, or like, yeah you know, something to worship like mar- marking people for kill to be killed and whatnot that's something that the characters pick up on you know it adds to that tone of unsettling you know the whole as you said the whole theme of the unknown is is what's at play here and this movie sets a sets a a dangerous uh like theme you know like you're kind of just waiting a lot a lot of the time for something to happen but in in turn that ends up uh having us constantly on edge Mm -hmm. you know constantly uh wondering what's around the corner and when the blood starts to spill uh it's good it's good yeah it's really well done the blood and there's a lot of again a lot of blood and everything kind of progresses in this movie like the kills get worse the use of blood yeah. and gore kind of gets worse i mean the the first really big kill is like a smack on the head with like a hammer yeah or a mallet um you know but then pam gets it um impaled by a meat hook and is hanging yeah. there watching all the stuff on the wall which that's kind of uh the first really like wow. messed yeah. up scene yeah. in this movie and <laughs> I was really foreshadowing what's going to come later. And it also makes me notice, like, the women in the group get the most brutal um, experience. Yeah, that definitely like, makes sense. I wonder if that's part of the message, as if, like, women are looked at as meat or, like, I don't know, something like this. Definitely makes society. sense because this family is made up of men. Yeah, exactly. You know, which is, you know, none of it is ever explained. But there's some weird sort of supernatural element too you know mm-hmm. they wheel down their grandpa who yeah, uh, just... at first seems to be just a corpse mm-hmm. you know they they there's a corpse upstairs in a chair and they bring him down and seat him at dinner but he's alive yeah kind of just barely um, and it seems like he's alive due to uh like witchcraft and uh, sacrifice mm-hmm. and whatnot um we could talk about this dinner scene because it's definitely the highlight of the movie. Well, by the time you get to the dinner scene, your senses are so heightened by like all this new information that's just been introduced in the new new movie. You have the incident in the van at the beginning, which just kind of creeped you out. Then they then they run out of gas. Then they start checking out the uh, houses, and you start to get the kills and like Pam on the meat cleaver. And then, of course, before we get to the dinner scene, yeah, yeah. out in the field at night when. Um, when uh, when Franklin gets killed, the guy in the wheelchair yeah. gets killed. Yeah. That's really well done in the dark. So you've just had all this crazy, like messed up stuff, and now you're seeing all this family that you've seen all this foreboding stuff about. You're seeing it all just come out now. It and comes full circle. Yeah, the anxiety is you know? just like yeah. high, and they're just acting like I don't know how to describe it, like demons, just like freaking out, yeah. going crazy, yeah. and there's like skin lamps. And just like uh, uh, it's just it, amazing set design, unbelievable. You know? It looks disgusting, and the film grain just adds to the whole look. It's one of the most terrifying uh, scenes in a movie. It's a scene that'll sick with you. Uh, so you know, it, it's it's disturbing, but all these loose threads are pulled together uh, mm-hmm. with this dinner yeah, scene, and the movie I don't think would hold up without it. No, nope. but what Makes really. The movie gets me about this dinner scene is who's the the last surviving uh character teenager the last surviving is sally so sally is the last victim and she sat down at this dinner table and the way that this scene is uh portrayed it makes you really really feel uh how scared she is you know there's long 
uh, undisturbed shots of these characters laughing, you know, close-ups on their disgusting faces. All of these shots go on for much longer than we're used to. Um, yeah, now, especially nowadays. And Sally, too, you got to give to her performance, too. Yeah. The terror in her eyes is uh, amazing. Like, there's two to three minutes of just close-ups on these faces of people laughing and it's just it it took me out of the film like it just made me uncomfortable and they definitely did that purposefully um and i just had the thought of watching it i feel the fear that this character is feeling and Mm -hmm. i think that that is was the purpose and and for a movie 50 years old to really still be able to do that especially i really this is one of the movies where i could recreate where I wish I could recreate the first um, viewing because it's just so effective and the exaggerated zooms uh, that yeah. that they did uh, in this movie in particular in like seventies movies just really work um, in this scene and it's so like I talked about in the last episode just the first time seeing this on a spare in high school with Caleb and Matt yeah. on the computer in the dark in the lecture hall and then that was we, perfect yeah you, eh? perfect and we just turn off the movie and we were all kind of like there we were just like what did i watch what the fuck yeah. did we just see like, that's the point yeah. you know it, it's it it's I, so uncut and so like raw raw and it makes you feel like is the movie glitching mm-hmm. like is this supposed to happen like it just yeah. the whole the scene feels like a mistake like an editing mistake yeah like it's it's, it's going on for too long but no it's it, it's done purposefully to make you feel uncomfortable. Um, wow, I want to rewatch it now. It's, rewatch this movie now. It's so incredible. And I just mean, like, I heard, I don't, I remember coming to class. I think you were in the class and saying, like, this movie is just, like, yeah. Uh, just it, you can't, you can't even d- describe it. You mm-hmm. know, like, just listening to us describe this right now, like, doesn't do it justice. You know, it's, it's something that you have to watch. It's even better if you watch it alone, mm-hmm. you know? Um, but I was watching it with my girlfriend and during that dinner scene, while they're all laughing and it was just uncut, like we're looking at each other like, what the fuck is going, what, the, yeah. what is going on? I've never seen anything like this. Um, and I think people, uh, it's best to like not know a lot. Like I, I want people to go into this movie with the same assumption I had about it, which is, was kind of just another slasher yeah. flick. Yeah. And you slowly start to realize that it's not and then by this dinner scene yeah it just shocks you it takes you back very disturbing but out of all of the kings of horror you know Ghostface and freddy and jason and michael myers leatherface and the texas chainsaw is definitely the most disturbing oh yeah by far the the, the, by far the most uh disturbing i'd like i i just feel like it's almost more impressive uh in how it's scary versus yeah. those those movies i feel like those other those other movies you listed rely more on like jump scares and like gore and uh have a certain um i guess formula to them uh but they're amazing but this one just it's more this one just scares you in a way more that's going to stick with you uh, i find than those other movies and it could be broken down like when i think of michael myers and halloween uh if I could describe it in one word, it's like it. it he he's a stalker. You yeah, know, he stalks people, and uh, Freddy is like terror. Yeah, exactly. you know, just chaos. Um, Ghostface is kind of like a, a ghost in disguise. You know, you don't know who's the culprit, or yeah. uh, it's the unknown. But this movie is just disturbing and mm. butchery. You know, so I like that of all all of the kings of horror, uh, they all have things that set them apart, and they all do do them differently and very well. But you know, I think Texas Chainsaw is a master class of a movie when it comes to uh, shock value and uh, creating disturbing scenes and sequences. Uh, we're not gonna get anything like this again. No, that's no, for sure. You know, well, they're trying to recreate it. Um, there's been lots of different iterations of Texas Chainsaw, but none uh, capture the essence as much as this original film does. And I feel like just to have the the physical like idea of having it on film 
uh, is part of what adds to the look. I just think it gives it. I want to have this great. on VHS. Yeah, that would this be. This nice. would be a cool, cool film to watch on VHS on an old box TV. Even if it was a little beat up and like the colors were yeah. a bit off, or yeah, something like that. definitely adds to it. Um, but yeah, you guys should definitely check it out. Um, it's it's one of the cornerstones of uh, horror films. Um, movies, period. I just think. Uh, in movies, period. It's such a. No, it nothing else in film does. Uh, make you feel None of that, nothing else in film makes you feel uh, disturbed quite like this film and it's just from a time when Hollywood was exploding in, in creativity and the and just the film industry was uh, experimenting a lot more than it used to in the past and uh, they were just kind of trying whatever you know it's kind of seems like I got a good segue yeah um, I wanted to talk about the terrifier again. Yeah. And you wanted to talk about the new Saw that came out. Briefly, briefly. The Both uh, recent films mm-hmm. you know, from the past five years, give or take, um, that do disturbing film, you know? Yeah. The Terrifier is disturbing and Saw is very disturbing too. So if we want to talk about films that uh, do not replicate what this movie uh, made but um recreate it in their own way uh the terrifier and saw do it well really well yeah um you really liked saw 10 uh tell me a little bit about it yeah i really uh i really enjoyed it um i mean i don't know <sighs> should i fully spoil it you no, know, don't spoil it because it's a new film, you sure. know, and I actually still want to see it. I haven't seen it, so well, just tell me about it as someone who hasn't seen it. Uh, I think it's a great uh, installment to the series. I think what it adds to the series is a very well done. I think look-wise, it looks uh, closer to the old ones. It kind of has this, like, yellow tint in certain scenes that I kind of associate with, like, a 90s, 2000s yeah. kind of horror look. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but uh, it just adds to the adds to the overall feeling the movie gives and um the way it puts the characters uh, in a new light uh that's my vague way of describing it is probably okay. the best thing about it and of course the games are fun and creative as usual and uh just really keeps the the movie uh interesting i actually really uh because we haven't talked about saw mm-hmm. but I what I really appreciate what I love what Saw separates from what separates it from other horror movies is the games to me like in a sick way uh, including with Saw X that's almost the most uh, fun part of the movie it Just puts the, you in the character's you know, shoes but it's, it's also like I could give a shit less about watching the actual kill because yeah. I'm desensitized to most gore yeah. and when you I know when you and I see a really gory kill it's more like ah oh, like or not like well, any done. kind of shock yeah, <laughs> yeah. right but um, the games are just, you know, they keep you on the edge of your seat, right? They yeah. just uh, they just keep you interested. There's just that part of your brain that uh, when when it's against the clock. Um, but yeah, just to uh, not go too deep into it, Saw X is, uh, is a nice installment to what seems to be a never-ending series. So I definitely re- recommend it. Uh, go check it out. I'm going to check it out. I'm going to try to see it in the theater this mm-hmm. month. Um, I was choosing between seeing Saw or seeing the new Exorcist, and apparently the new Exorcist isn't that hot. Yeah, uh, I heard it's disrespectfully bad. That was one yeah. review I saw. So, you know, good reviews. Diego likes it. Saw 10. Um, so I'm going to definitely check it out. Um, but another movie I said that's equally as disturbing, in, in a different right, uh, is The Terrifier. Um and it, it takes a much cheaper approach, you know, it, it doesn't really have an overall tone, you know, like Texas Chainsaw does, but the Terrifier has that shock value. Um, and it created this character of Art the Clown that I do want to put up there with mm. um, Freddy and Leatherface and Michael Myers. Um, would you put him up there, you know, or, or as like a new media type of horror figure you know he's gained so much popularity and and notoriety in the horror scene lately and i'm just happy that these new characters are still being created and celebrated 
I don't know. I don't know if I would put him up there. How dare you? Quite yet. <laughs> I don't view him as that kind of... I don't know. I don't view him as that. I don't know if I think... Uh, I don't know if I hold Terrifier as in, like, as high esteem yet. And especially because the second one um, isn't as strong. Um, the second one is... Yeah. But I know. guess you could say that about the movie we just talked about. But, I mean, I it is... I'd say the kills are very strong. Um, it is very shocking. It kept me on the edge of my seat. Um, it's a bad movie. Like you got to understand when you're getting into it, it's a bad movie. Yeah. It's way over the top in terms of cheese. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of the times when you're watching horror slasher films, they're all like that. And that's yeah. half the reason we like them, you know, and I think the terrifier embraces that. And that was his goal from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, and look, The Terrifier is not a great film on paper, and neither is the second one. Um, I wish the second one was shorter, yeah. because it's over two hours long, and it tries to insert some sort of story to it, when that mm-hmm. was never the yeah. point of The Terrifier in the first place. Um, so inserting this story and um, creating backstory for these characters and everything, you know, that's not why we liked the terrifier. We liked the terrifier Mm. because it was low budget and it was cheap, but it, it did a lot with uh, what it was given. Um, I'm, I'm on such a terrifier art, the clown wave right now. I just love it so much. I think the first one is very, very strong. Great movie. Uh, the second one, uh, doesn't hold up as much to, uh, as much, uh, (laughs) But, it has equally as impressive gore and kills. Yeah, That's I think he's sure. a great character. I just I can't find anything wrong with it. I just feel like the only reason I don't hold it in such esteem is because I feel like those other classics uh, were maybe innovative in a way that that uh, Terrifier wasn't. But there's certainly things that Terrifier does uh, do differently. The Terrifier definitely um, pays respect. Yeah. To the films that came before it, mm. you know, the Terrifier wouldn't exist if not for these early uh, 70s, 80s, 90s horror films. Yeah, and I, I like the... That's uh, half the point of it. Yeah, and I mean, I enjoy um, I enjoy the kills, right? Like, I mean, they're uh, just particularly brutal and are even, I mean, at least for me, still, um, you know, I guess thrilling or a bit disturbing uh, to watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So even still to this day... Uh, I haven't seen it in a long... I don't think I've seen it since we talked about it last. I'm actually trying to get to get a hold of the Steelbook. Oh, okay. You know, cool. I'm actually kind of wanting to collect uh, horror, horror movies on DVD now. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm trying to get a hold of the Terrifier uh, 1 and 2, uh, the Steelbooks. I actually saw a collector's edition okay. for the Terrifier. That comes with a bunch of knickknacks and stickers and figures, but it comes with the Terrifier on VHS. Oh, cool. Which is mm-hmm. which is really cool, you know. So, and the guy who who uh, made the film, produced the film, Damien uh, Leone, Damien Leone, he's a, a huge, huge horror fan. Um, so that's you know, I, I do feel the passion for mm-hmm. the genre in the Terrifier. You know, he was just inspired by cheesy horror films, and that's why he wanted to make uh, the Terrifier. Um, and I, you know, the movies aren't that great, but the character is. Yeah, know? it's a great. It's a. And I hope with there, there has to be a third Terrifier on the way. Um, I hope they make it shorter, and I hope they make it simpler, and get back to uh, just my mindless killing and mindless yeah. gore because that's that's why we like it. Um, I actually wanted to ask you. Uh, Later this month, the end of October, there's a horror convention in Niagara Falls. It's called Frightmare in the Falls. Yeah. I think it's a horror convention. Okay. So it's a lot like Fan Expo, um, just horror. Uh, So we got a lot of characters from Saw, The Walking Dead, producer of The Terrifier and the Art the Clown, the man who plays him. Okay. We'll be there. Ron Perlman from Hellboy. You know, it's. I was actually surprised at the uh, the guest appearances. So I really do want to get get around. I do want to go to this convention. When is it? The end of the month. 
Look it up right now. Uh, Frightmare at the Falls. Frightmare at the Falls. It's a horror convention in Niagara Falls. I've never been, but you know, if we do go, I'd love to cover it for you guys. Maybe just throw up a quick video on YouTube. Oh yeah, we can um, probably do this. It looks like a big event though. Um, do we get mags in on this? Yeah, we should. We should get as many people uh, to go because it looks like a really, really good time. Um, yeah. We've been talking about getting some more guests on the show or doing some more um, visiting some cool conventions and spots like this. And whatnot. Trying some other stuff. Trying some new stuff. Movies so. are a bit rocky right now. So Are they? You know? I feel There's like a lot we, of misses. I feel like you and I, we, we kind of, we're kind of trying to talk, talk about different things and do different things because... We were just kind of a bit stale talking about some stuff. I've yeah, we had a bit of a rough one for sure in a while. But um, I actually checked out Loki, season oh, two. How was that? The first episode was yeah. great. Mm. Um, the first episode was bam, 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 bam. You know, it, yeah. it, it. I was surprised. I was just hanging out on Disney Plus one night, and I saw season two started in episode one, the premiere. So I'm like, fuck, whatever, what the hell, right? I'll just mm. throw it on. You know, I wasn't a fan of the new Ant-Man. I wasn't a fan of the past five Marvel projects. Yeah. But I'm like, hey, I'll throw up Loki season two because I liked the first season. And the premiere episode was fantastic. It was really, really good. Um, it was fast paced. It was at least 40 minutes long and it just starts and goes. Yeah. Um, there's a sense of chaos in the TVA um, because that's how this uh, first season ended. Um, it's really well done. The first episode, at least. Uh, when we finish recording, I'm probably, I think episode two is out. I'm going to catch it. But look, guys, I understand the Marvel fatigue and uh, Marvel projects are falling flat lately. But I liked episode one of season two of Loki. Um, so I hope it does well because Marvel needs it, man. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's just tough. It's been so long, even. Since the last season, and it's kind of just like, I don't even that, remember. Is that 2020? I think 2020 Might as well is when Loki came out, right? Oh my god. Let's see. And this is becoming my problem with a lot of shows with long gaps. Even uh, Sex Education, I uh, I just finished. Because I just need something to watch. Yeah. And I totally forgot that show existed. But I have seen every episode. So I was like, okay, I'll watch the last season, which wasn't very great but i find it just hard to follow like because yeah. you get to this dilemma where i don't feel like watching the whole show over again because yeah. i know it well enough where it would be boring to do that and yeah. i don't want to rewatch three seasons of tv or whatever the heck it was yeah but um but then you just end up sitting through this one final season kind of slightly confused there's so the much entire time there's so much tv now yeah. you know and i think just tv in general has become uh repetitive for me you know um that's why i'm really enjoying uh the halloween season and the horror season you know just revisiting old classics you know yeah. that i just it's my first time seeing texas chainsaw so it was nice to uh to get that you know yeah. there's tons of hidden gems i told you last week i subscribed to shutter on prime and it's just filled with uh, old horror films, classic horror films that I've never heard of, you know. So I have a hard time just watching something that I have no idea about, you know. Um, but that's how you discover new things. You yeah, know? exactly. Well, I'm thinking of getting movie. What's movie? That's a cheaper, I don't like, it's a cheaper, on the cheaper end as uh, far as like a streaming service. But I'm pretty sure it's like, Somebody actually recommends you the uh, movie. Like it's oh, humans. really? Recommended. But Man, a streaming service like integrated with some sort of social media. Yeah, and would be it, a great idea. Yeah, to have but, people like physically recommend movies that you can watch on the fly like that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and it and it does movies by like uh, emerging and like established filmmakers that's cool so, man. and it's kind of and they kind of exist to broaden people's like tastes so i'm like i don't know i think about um joining it um but i don't know sometimes i kind of want to join more obscure streaming services yeah. and see if i can broaden my knowledge of yeah. cinema yeah of, uh, you know and maybe this the streaming service staleness of shows or being so much to watch and everything, I'm not surprised 
that I have this urge to collect physical media again. Yeah. And start a collection of uh, old movies and horror films and whatnot. Because we know... We really, like, where we were born in 2000, right? Mm-hmm. So we just missed that uh, era where people had hundreds and hundreds of DVDs, you know, a physical media collection. Yeah. Um, my family had a movie collection. Um, I think we caught the tail end. I th- I would say we caught the tail end, but, man, I'd love to have a bookcase full of DVDs that maybe I haven't seen, you know? Yeah. So then when you have a movie night, you can physically pick out a movie yeah. and stick it in the DVD player and watch it, yeah. you know? We, we didn't have too long in that world. Um, yeah. I really think, like, I feel like 2010 is when, I mean, we were, like, little kids, so my memory could be. But I feel like 2010 is when I feel like things started to really shift. Like, I swear, before that, I remember it was, like, mostly DVDs, and I remember people, like, knowing people who didn't have cell phones. Yeah. Or, like, didn't care. But then around, like, 2010, after that, it was, like, yeah, uh, yeah, new world, like... There was a weird era, like, after DVDs have died down, before streaming services popped off. Well, that was, like, the worst. Like, when we were in high... (sighs) It's, like, grade 8 going into high school. Yeah. Or, like, late elementary school, yeah. I don't... That was... That was the worst time to kind of be in in anything, Um, even for music too because i mean just there was everybody was just pirating everything there was yeah. no uh real alternative mind you theaters were still doing well um, yeah th- i think around 2010 to 2011 like our family dvd player broke mm-hmm. and we didn't watch a lot of dvds anymore so i'm like and we didn't have netflix or anything like that yet so there's this weird era where i'm wasn't watching a lot mm-hmm. you know just because ease of Ease of access. Yeah, it's gone. It wasn't really there. Yeah. You know, so... I do want to get back into collecting physical media. Do you Have you ever had that urge? Yeah, well, I did it for, like, uh, Quentin Tarantino when I first really got into him, like, years ago. Uh, so I have everything of his. Uh, I have a few other movies, like, some of my all-time favorites. So I got, like, a decent-sized collection. There's a few in his storage room next to us. Yeah. Um... Like, so yeah, just like mild time favorites, but not, not too, too much. Yeah. Nothing crazy. Um, Makes me want to buy a DVD player. You know, I have, like, I just, um. I just have the Xbox. Yeah, I, I, if I want to watch a DVD, I'll pop it in the Xbox, but there's probably, uh, good cheap DVD players that we could pick up now. Uh, which I kind of want to buy. I guess I shouldn't buy them until I have enough DVDs to justify that purchase. There's a video yeah. store in um, in Stone Road Mall in Guelph. A video store? Yeah, Straight that's up, cool. Straight I, up video store. Yeah. Like, you guys, so. <clears throat> uh, Lime Ridge Mall in Hamilton. They got, a, they got a DVD store. All DVDs. A lot of these... Uh, record stores and whatnot they got t-shirts and figures and, yeah you know, this store is just dvds yeah same with All the one in DVDs. Stone Road. there's a couple that have come back i mean i i honestly mostly buy dvds for um concert footage yeah because yeah concert footage most of it's up on youtube but there's not as much like not i'm talking like pro shot right mm-hmm. not like cell phone video there's always going to be tons of that yeah but like um but I'm talking pro shot concert footage from what over the decades, whether it's back in the day or now, right? Um, there's still a lot of it up on YouTube, plenty to watch on YouTube, but there's not as much as there used to be. There's a big difference between the pro shots and what yeah. you find on YouTube. But even pro shots, so like when I was a kid going on YouTube, it was tons, right? Because yeah, yeah. this is less restrictive, yeah. right? And now there's like becoming less and less and less and less and less. And yeah. the ones that, and a lot of the ones that is up on YouTube is like official, please yeah. sanction, right? So. And a lot of these artists now, though, there's no DVD market, so this stuff won't come out on DVD. I think Taylor Swift's new tour, yeah, being pro shot, sold DVD. Now, so a lot of new artists are can do it or like are putting it on streaming. But I'm just talking the catalog of like music live performances from all artists, old artists, new artists. Um, there's a lot that will just get lost yeah. because a ton of it doesn't get put on streaming. It gets taken off YouTube because of copyright. And then there's no DVD market. Yeah. So there's no point uh, in releasing them anymore. 
So there's um, so I buy a lot of uh, live concert DVDs to just to like hold on to that because I feel like yeah. a lot of that stuff is gonna be uh, maybe harder to find. And it already is. Well, look, like, me and you used to game a lot, so mm. that's why we have the Xbox, right? So we're just lucky to be able to watch DVDs on it. Yeah. But most households just don't have don't have DVD players anymore. No. My mom, my dad, uh, my girlfriend's family, they don't have DVD players, you know? So that's the only way I can watch it is through the game console. Um even everyone, uh, a lot of people now have gaming PCs, um, computers, gaming PCs. They don't no disc drives. Yeah, exactly. Anymore, even a lot of cars. You know, no My CD players. My car doesn't have one. Yeah, um, there was a dude hang, hanging outside of Sobeys the other day, and he's mm. selling his mixtape. I'm like, yeah, what the hell? I bought it off him for five bucks. Like, yeah, I'll support. I'll help you support your. Uh, I can't listen to it. I no. can't pop it in the car. Okay, well, here's the thing. Why is he doing that? I don't know, man. This is not nineteen ninety seven. You gotta do a social media campaign. Sorry to that guy. Promoting your music on social media. You it's just the way you gotta do it now. Nobody, okay, nobody a wants to fucking pay for music, so nobody's buying your CD. That that mentality is gone. Yeah. For most people, and especially for its music they've never heard of, people don't see the value in that. Okay, and again, it's not like nineteen ninety five. Why are you going out and handing? Yeah mixtapes right like i mean you're gonna your whole audience is gonna be online here's the explanation okay uh-huh. i got one for you maybe he gets posted or something. i was just watching a youtube video on the biggest scams in new york city and everything mm-hmm. yeah the people in the the mascots whatever will jump in your photo and ask you for 10, 20 bucks you know but a big scam apparently is people selling mixtapes and cds oh. and music and half the time there's nothing on the cd so i haven't played this cd i bought off him but for all i know there's nothing on it and it's a scam you know it's just people out there scamming uh, yeah. with fake mixtapes you know sure. the cover art is god awful it took probably a minute to put it together so i really wonder if it was a scam yeah i mean who knows right i mean yeah you know, SoundCloud has been a thing for a long time now, you know, and Spotify, I mean, we, we got our show up on Spotify. It's not hard to get no. your stuff posted on YouTube well, you should Spotify. just be on TikTok. Exactly. So it really makes no sense to be yeah. uh, making mixtapes and selling CDs anymore. I Like, if you really are, I respect it, respect it, you know, trying to get your physical media in people's hands, but... No. It's not smart anymore. No, not really. Not if you're starting yeah, out. I kind of don't respect it. If you have a following, yeah, it's a good way to make a lot of money because you can make not a lot yeah. of money, but you can make decent money selling overpriced vinyl to your fans, right? Yeah. Like, But, yeah, 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 yeah. but uh, it's starting out. People buy vinyl now as if it's merch. You know, well, they just is. want that collector's item. That's basically what uh, it is to a lot of people, right? But that's if you have a following, right? Like, People don't see the value in your mix. People haven't been paying for music directly in forever, and yeah. they're just or, or you know, so that's just not gonna it's just not gonna fly. Anyway, yeah, but anyway, point is, we should get into more uh, physical uh, physical collecting. I would love to add these classics that we've talked about well, today. Look, um, let's say there's a f- apocalypse and the world ends and there's no more internet. Yeah, well, then we what have the it. hell are you going to watch? Yeah. There's nothing to watch unless you have these physical media. Mm-hmm. This physical media, you know? Well, let's say um, some of these companies go bankrupt or, God forbid, uh, you go bankrupt yourself and you can't pay for Spotify or anything mm-hmm. anymore. You have no music to listen to. You got no movies to watch on your streaming services. What are you going to do for entertainment? You don't own any of the stuff you listen to. Well, that's, so, why, I, that's why I got my favorites right Yeah, now, exactly. Right. So... Maybe it's it is it is more smart than people think, more smart than people smarter. think. It's smarter than people think to own physical media, you know. And it it starts with being a fan of something. If you're a fan of something, you want to own, you know, the physical media. So, and it's just a better way to uh, uh, take everything in. Uh, you don't end up really watching uh, anything new on streaming because you're overwhelmed yeah. by choice. Half and the stuff people watch on streaming services they've seen ten well, times. And it already. becomes like a YouTube page, right? It all yeah. just becomes content and you're putting um you're putting you're putting Norbit next <laughs> yeah. to Shawshank Redemption. Yeah. And now they're on the same level. Um 
you know, right? So it's just, uh, it's the DVD is it's a slower way to take things in and slowly build it up. It was just a, now it's too overwhelming and you really don't end up watching uh, much, if anything at all. Yeah, that's uh, for sure. But yeah, so, but if you haven't seen Texas Chainsaw Massacre, um, don't get lost in the streaming sea. Watch it. It's uh, yeah. incredible. The original 1974 version. Go out and see Saw X. Fun theater experience. Uh, always, I need to catch it. Yeah. Always get out in the theater. And uh, yeah, it's Air Fire. Great, uh, great movie to add to your spooky season yeah. list. Yeah, for sure. One more thing is... So I was in this DVD store, mm-hmm. right? And I found the Terrifier and DVD and everything, but I wanted the Steelbook, as I said. So I went and asked the lady at the counter. She's like, oh, the Steelbook is a Best Buy exclusive oh. uh, for Terrifier 1. And I'm like, what about Terrifier 2? Terrifier 2 Steelbook is a Walmart exclusive. What the fuck? Now, if you want the steel book, you have to buy it from Best Buy. You have to buy it from. Well, Walmart. that's why they do that, right? That's and why then they... they sell out, and they're on eBay for. I saw the Terrifier One steel book on eBay for three hundred and fifty dollars. Oh yeah, so well, that's become collectors' items, and people are scalping them. And well, that's why you do that, though, right? Like, I mean, that's that's been going on forever. You have every store is a separate exclusive, yeah. so the sucker hardcores. We'll buy from every single store. Dude, I bought this. So for everyone listening, I bought this cup from Starbucks today. And it's a green, neon green slime cup. You know, I bought it because, you know, our podcast and everything, but whatever. Yeah. Um, but it's a Starbucks 2023 Halloween exclusive. This cup was 40 bucks, and it's being resold online for 100 bucks. Um, people scalping them. Everything gets scalped these days. Even yeah. fucking Starbucks cups. So well, it's the ease, right? So it's easy to do. But I'm a collector. You know, I like collecting action figures and whatnot. So I guess maybe that's half the reason why I want to collect physical media. You know, mm. just to have that physical collection. But I think that's all for today, guys. Um, is our little review on the Texas Chainsaw. Any ideas what you want to talk about next week? Should no. we keep going with the main horror slashers? Yeah, well, or we can just... I feel like it's whatever you and I kind of dig. Yeah, uh, whatever we're feeling. Yeah, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah, check out, check out the... Uh, check out the Saw Chainsaw by Ramones. Inspired by Ooh. this movie. Uh, Maybe that will play us out today. Yeah, great little punk song. We should get it to play us out. Have you seen Friday the 13th? Yeah, like a long time ago. That's a great one. Because I haven't seen any of them. Evil Dead. Would you be sick to it? I watched it? Army of Darkness. Sure. We'll figure it out. Yeah, we'll figure it out. And um, nice to be back on the audio-only show. Um, so I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode. And we will hit you next week with another uh, spooky season slime episode for the month of October. All right, and that's us. Thank you guys for listening today. We'll catch you on the next one. Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Texas Texas Chainsaw Massacre. There, Diego playing us out for today.